fuck cares? And I'm not there. So I'm calling you both out. Oh, oh, I feel the tension. I feel the tension right here, right now. You come on, you interrupt such a great, passionate conversation between the two of us, thinking that you're going to change things. Let me tell you something, brother. The only thing that's going to be needed changing is your pants after we get done with you. Oh, so you think so you think that this show is important that it matters? Is that what you think? I don't think it I doesn't know. matter what you think. <laughs> Rich, you can come on here. The pod rockers, it's a pod. Peas in a pod. That's two. You come on trying to be our third wheel. There's no third wheel here, buddy. <laughs> You can't ride it without a front wheel. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> There's a front wheel that steers this ship. And the only person that can hold that wheel is the master podcaster. Okay. All right. All right. You, 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 you have some valid points. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I might not like you, but I respect you. And for that, I'm offering my hand. Cheer shot from the back. Whack. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> you see what we do? You see what we do? <laughs> You're lucky it was a barbershop window, you punk. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Richard. And I'm Sean Michael. And I'm Party John Eddie. And together we are the Pod Rockers of Bromance. <laughs> oh, man. John, Party John Eddie, welcome back for a very exciting episode. We got rudely interrupted as we were pre matching it up, setting up our match by the Master Podcaster. But we are excited to have you on. It's Party Janetti. It's Shawn Michael. It's the master podcaster. We are going to talk wrestling. All elite wrestling. Oh, yeah. I, I am so happy to be back. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's, it's awesome to be back on the air and do something a little bit positive here. And I cannot wait to talk about it. Yeah, we had talked, uh, so I went to an AEW wrestling event back in February, back when you could be in crowds, and <laughs> I was less than six feet away from people, and we were sharing drinks and sharing popcorn, and it was amazing, and then the world happened, And but before that, we were talking during that episode, it's like, we need to review Double or Nothing, because it's been a long time since Richard sat down and watched wrestling, and we said... Master podcaster Richard, you need to watch Double or Nothing, which was supposed to take place in Vegas, which a year ago I was actually in Vegas when the first ever Double or Nothing happened, and I wanted to go. I found tickets for like 12 bucks, Party Genetti, Master Podcaster, $12 tickets. I, I still can't believe you didn't get that opportunity and yeah. take it. Mrs. Shawn Michaels said, we're not doing that. And so I missed out <laughs> on one of the <laughs> biggest events of 2019. So this year, Double or Nothing didn't happen in Vegas. It happened at Daly's Place in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, with a crowd of just wrestlers. And I think they had some fans there, too. But I still enjoyed the event. I thought it was a great pay-per-view. And I'm really excited to see what you guys have to talk about. So I guess, like, general reviews. Let's start with Master Podcaster, because he's this is like his first wrestling event in a long time. So Master Podcaster, I want to know, what did you feel in your deep tights, like how tight did your tights get watching <laughs> um, double or nothing? So I was, I, I was curious. I was like, you know, this all has a Vegas theme. I was like, I wonder if this was supposed to happen in Vegas. And then because of, you know, circumstances and whatnot, they, you know, decided to move it to, cause I was like, there's, they got like a row of slot machines there. There's like poker chips. I was wondering if I was like, this feels like it should have taken place in Vegas. Um, so overall, I was entertained, but I will say that it did not give me the nostalgia feels from when I watched wrestling in my in my younger years. 
No. So, so it was, but that being said, like I didn't, you know, I didn't have the swell up of nostalgia and big teary eyes, but I was entertained. Were you a WWF guy or WCW guy? I was, I, well, both. Like, okay, so I started watching, like, you're like, I'm gonna start watching again from like the inception of the new world order all the way through till like the end of the attitude era. Yeah, because I was, see, I feel like this gives me more nostalgia because I was early WCW. And then when Hulk Hogan went to the NWO, it broke my little like eight year old heart. And so I had to stop yeah. watching WCW. So this always kind of gives me that feel <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> so Party Genetti, how'd you feel about it? Just from a top level kind of getting to see it, not at Vegas, but still getting it uh, as a very well-produced pay-per-view. Oh yeah. I, I enjoyed it for what it was and what they had to do with it. You know, you kind of miss that crowd and I know they've uh, been filling in with having wrestlers and whatnot. I thought that was a great improvised move to to put the wrestlers in the audience for this uh for dynamite and now this and like you said there was a few fans there and uh it, it still was weird but it was unique and it's something that's going to be remembered and and overall just a fun pay-per-view yeah i was wondering did they have the fans mic'd up because like because they were loud yeah, they were loud you i know, think they would have to for- yeah for a crowd of only like, I'd say probably like what, like twenty total. Yeah, if you watch, they did have like wrestlers around the ring, so there's probably about mm-hmm. twenty five to thirty there. But then there was like sparse crowds, like even further back, if I yeah. remember correctly. Because yeah. I know Dynamite, their paper, their uh, Wednesday night show, it seems like they have that set up too, and it would be smart to put some mics closer to it because it. You know, if you didn't see out in the crowd, it obviously wasn't as loud, but you still had some good interactions that it felt like there was a live audience watching the events, which, yeah, I'm still surprised none of the other wrestling programs have decided to do this same thing. Well, it's probably expensive, you know, because you because like, I mean, they even said like everybody in this building has been tested before they came in the building. Yeah, but I know other shows are are still going on, so like they still have to test all unless they're bringing them in with smaller amounts. But they still have to test all the people, mm-hmm. and it, it could be a mm-hmm. wrestling thing. You don't want to admit defeat by copying somebody else, which you never see copying done in wrestling. No, no, never. of course not, not at all, Mm-mm. not once. <laughs> well, I know. Party Dronetti and Master Podcaster. I, I heard Master Podcaster had quite a few notes, so I guess we can kind of take this in chronological order. Uh, and I figured we could start with the first match. It was on the uh, buy-in for Double or Nothing, and it was the best friends taking on Private Party. So, Party Dronetti, let's start with you. How did you feel about this match? What were some of your highlights, lowlights? What were your thoughts? Uh, you know, for this one, I, I, I always kind of forget about the pre-show stuff. And, and I know like WWE was kind of famous for doing that sort of thing. So I really didn't pay that close attention to this one. I'm not going to lie. I, I just kind of let it play in the background. And uh, by the time I knew it, it was already over. So <laughs> I can't even tell you what went on with that. Uh, it was just uh, on while I was doing some other things. You know, I, I mean, I, I wish I could say more than that, but that, that's just how it was for me. Yeah, I know Private Party's been out for a while uh, just because I think I'm not sure where they're from or if they or if they're a higher risk kind of thing. So they've just kind of stayed away from the dynamite tapings. Yeah. And I don't that you kind of saw a little bit of their ring rust, I think. Uh, Mm -hmm. but I'm a big best friends fan. Like I like Chuck Taylor and Trent. I think they're kind of, they're, they're kind of like a a good kind of comedic, but it's kind of serious, like tag team. Yeah. Uh, This match felt like it went on for a really long time, which is kind of a pre-show. I think thing where you have a match that takes up half the the pre-show, then the other half is getting you hyped to buy the pay-per-view. Yeah. But it, it ended kind of how I expected. I expected the best friends to win and it was a number one contenders match. Um, I watched this like the day after. So it was all kind of in like one, uh, one like viewing. So like you didn't have to watch the pre-show, then watch the pay-per-view. They kind of tied it all together Mm -hmm. post-production. So interesting match. But, uh, so then Richard, so you, this is the first match you see. 
on your first reviewing of wrestling or getting back into wrestling, what do you feel about it? What do you think about it? <clears throat> um, so as far as like starts of a pay per view go, the ones I recall were usually very muted. Like it didn't like it, like the ones I remember. It was usually something that nobody really cared about. It was just hey, let's get some bodies on the screen. This, however, felt like a better start, a better kickoff to me. It felt like it was a. It, it felt like it was a more. It was a a a more more of an attention grabber than what I recall. So I was like, okay. I was like, we're starting off. We're starting off decent. Okay. Well, it was actually for something too, because I remember back in the day, like the free for alls on like WWS pay per views. It was always kind of like you know. Uh, Savio Vega versus Steve from Section Six. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, like I was always hyped. It, as a kid, it's funny because as a kid, whenever I watched the free for all, I always had this small hope that like something would go wrong and I would get the pay per view for free because my oh, parents yeah, never right. got it for me. <laughs> and every time it'd be like, oh, it's kicking off. Oh, I'm going to get to watch the pay per view for free. And like 10 minutes into it, you're like, all right, well, guess not this time. And you go back to wrestling with your own little wrestling action figures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, as far as, as far as the start of, you know, of like a way to like, you know, kind of grab your attention. I felt like it was, it, I mean, grab my attention. It was like, okay, we're starting off. We're starting off with this. Okay. I'm good. Let's see where we go from here. So we get into the first actual match of the pay-per-view. It's the casino ladder match for the a future AEW World Championship match. And the the basic story of this is there's a big poker chip hanging at the top of the building. You got to climb a ladder to get it. And every two minutes, a new competitor is going to come in. So there was also a surprise, unannounced uh, wrestler in this event, and... I'm, I don't know too much about him. Party Genetti, you might know a little bit more about, about him. I just know he is a massive, massive man. Oh, yeah. That looks like, like he, the guy's, yeah. The guy's Brian Cage. That's his name. Yeah. And he comes out and he rips a ladder in half. You know, like this fucking dude needs business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so, the dude. and he was just kind of like toss, like, th- like one yeah. arm, like toss, throw people over their, he- over his head. Yeah, Brian Cage is a is a big boy uh, who eats basically like three thousand calories per meal. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's and he's athletic as all can be, and you kind of only got a taste of what this man's capable of. If you've watched uh, Lucha Underground or or Impact Wrestling, you've seen him uh, on the Independence as well. Very talented guy, and uh, it's it's a great sign by AEW. So, like with Brian Cage, I know some guys are really open about like, no, I do all this clean, and some people like the genetic freak. I think he's come out and like he doesn't do it clean. Is Brian Cage one of those guys that does this stuff clean? Like those are clean muscles, or is that like not talked about? Uh, I'll be completely honest. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I mean, I'm always I curious can, about I can that. Give with my some opinion. Of these guys. <laughs> you know that's not natural when he came on it's all keto <laughs> when yeah. he came on stage and my wife saw him she's like why don't you look like that like it's not natural babe yeah <laughs> why I'm do you like, think my that his neck muscles are as thick <laughs> as my dick did you reply why don't you look like that <laughs> yeah during the the Sheeta or the uh penelope ford match yeah i didn't do that because i'd have to sleep on the couch <laughs> <laughs> she makes fun of my dad, but I'm like, why do you think my finishing move is the dad joke? <laughs> mm. Mm. But so Richard, you know, this is a very high pace. So yeah, so the idea, two minutes coming in, um, Brian Cage was the one that won this. And, you know, he came out, was the last one out, just kicked everybody's ass. They they buried him un- up under a bunch of stuff for like five or 10 minutes. And he comes roaring out like some Jason Voorhees, Friday the 13th, crazy killer beats everybody up. I, the one thing I feel really bad about this for you, Richard, is that the guy Darby Allen, the one that had half his face painted, you did not get to see the skill of Darby Allen. Like they did not get a good display. Is he a, is he a big, is he a big flyer? He is. Yeah. He's, he's off the top rope. He's quick. He's athletic. He's, he's a lot of fun to watch. And in this, he kind of got hurt kind of quick. I, I don't think he actually got hurt. I think it was, uh, kind of trying to push his character along. But um, I mean, 
I wouldn't be surprised if he did because he jumped off of a ladder onto another ladder on a skateboard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. As, as when it, I, I was curious, like all, all of, all of these wrestlers, like in terms of their status in, in, in the, in the league right now, or that were they all kind of like, I don't know, for lack of a better word, were they all like B players uh, I mean, they're kind of like, m- most of them are what you would consider, I mean, there's not really like a mid card top card in AEW, mm-hmm. um, but like Darby Allen, uh, Orange Cassidy, uh, Kip Sabian, Luchasaurus, those guys are kind of newer on the scene. Uh, okay. Scorpio Sky, Frank Kazarian, um, Colt Cabana, they're kind of more, uh, veterans, I guess is the best way to put it. I guess uh, I the reason I bring it up is because like I feel like this was a good way to if if these were all like newer people or you know I uh, th- this is a great way to like showcase them in in a in a big setting. Uh, if if this was like first year double or nothing, uh, in my opinion, it, it probably would have been. But uh, most of these guys like Darby Allen and uh, Kip Sabian, Luchasaurus, those guys have been around for a while. So I feel okay, like they didn't get okay. a and John, what do you think? I just felt like they didn't get like a great opportunity to kind of showcase their stuff in this. Yeah, and and that's the thing with ladder matches. I I know some guys. If you listen to shoot interviews and all that too, that some guys openly admit that they just absolutely despise doing ladder matches because really it's you don't get anything in except for high spots and the chance of getting hurt. And so, you know, a lot of guys just are like, oh, God, let's just get this over with. Uh, If that was Mm -hmm. your first time seeing these guys wrestle, you really didn't get a good taste for what they're uh, able to do. Uh, It was just kind of an overall what you're typically expecting for a ladder match nowadays. Uh, But there were fun uh, moments in it as well. Uh, Oh, yeah. But in in the same vein of it, it was just kind of like, okay, uh, I was hoping that we would get something a little bit different. I really loved at the beginning, Brian cage comes out and immediately like everyone's like, all right, let's throw a bunch of stuff on top of them. (laughs) And, and, you know, and then guys are going to land on top of the stuff to continuously, you know, (laughs) that death Valley driver from Janelle on top of that. (laughs) Somebody had to be close by and be like, all right, here it comes. Here it comes. Get ready. Yeah, Yeah. Right. Exactly. I also, I felt like there was too many ladders. Like you didn't need that many ladders. Yeah, like two tops. Yeah, right. And that, that I think it felt like there was like what, like four. Oh, there was. Yeah, there was a ton, man. There was there was an absolute ton. And and ladder matches themselves have just gotten more and more ridiculous with ladders and ladder spots and all that. Oh yeah, and, yeah. You know, what I, was I mean, it? A lot, you can go a long way with just one. I mean, look at Razor Ramon and and Shawn Michaels. Uh, two and, of the best ladder matches. Right. That WrestleMania. And that was just one ladder. And I like. <clears throat> I think it was like tag team for like tag team. I've seen tag team matches where they would use two ladders and you're like, okay, I get that. There's two of them. Yeah. But you don't need, you don't need five ladders in, in, in a, in a, in a ring. When I always feel like these matches, like, so whenever it's tag teams, at least it's like two on two kind of thing. But with this, it's kind of an all for one, none for all kind of scenario. And it's almost Uh like Royal Rumbles where as a kid, I love them, but now they always seem real clunky. And there's just so much going on and so much not going on at the same time. Yeah, right. Yes, I I agree. I feel like that's a point I'll have to come. We'll have to come back to later. Now, Richard, as somebody who doesn't know the greatness of freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy, <laughs> I want to know what your thoughts were when you saw him come out. When I saw him come out and not understand how a ladder works. <laughs> yes. I mean... I think he was trying to come across as like, oh, I have people do this for me, but it didn't come across that way. It came across as him going, how does the ladder work? Yeah. So his gimmick is basically he uh, just doesn't care. So like they were saying, like they've explained to him how this match works like 20 sometimes. And then when he goes out there and like, you, you got to get the, you got to get on the ladder. You got to get the, the chip. And him walking out there and just looking up at it and trying to reach for it on the ground and then setting the ladder up and it just falls straight down. If Yeah. Because it took because the first my first exposure to Orange Cassidy, and this is this is where Party Genetti has like all the knowledge because I saw him, I think it was was it 
all in? Was he at that pay per view or was it the or was it double or nothing last year he showed up? Oh gosh, I think he was I think he made an appearance at All In. Because I remember him doing something I forget what battle royal it was, but he did the thing with uh Tommy Dreamer where he was yeah. doing all the kicks. So his 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 thing with this Richard is he basically like will kick him in the shins like really softly. And so uh-huh. when I saw this for the first time, I see this guy with his hands in his pocket walk up to uh, a wrestler I know, like I've known my whole life, and like kick him in the yeah. shins real softly. And the crowd, every time he like connects with it, and like it's like a kid kick, like barely taps. And the crowd okay. goes, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and then he backs up and they go, oh. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? <laughs> But watching the progression over the last year since he's been in AEW, this is one of my favorite wrestlers. And they, they've they kind of coined him like, uh, was it Master of Sloth style? <laughs> yeah. And so like when he turns it on, he actually turns it on. But, you know, for the most part, it's just kind of like lackadaisical and kind of like, all right. Okay, well. so it's apathy. Yeah. So it was supposed to be apathy. Like, I don't give a shit. Because honestly, because like, you know, because... Uh, haven't seen anything before it. It just comes across as a guy that walks into the ring and doesn't know how a ladder is supposed to function. Yeah. And I could see how you said, like, you think people do stuff for him. Cause he kind of has that like glasses kind of like I'm too cool for school kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, party Janetti or Richard, do you guys have anything else to add to this casino ladder match? No, overall it was a fun, entertaining match. Uh, I, I shouldn't have been surprised that Brian cage was the winner of it. I know we do that fantasy league on Facebook and uh, I tried my best to just change my answers up and, uh, oh man, I, I failed completely. <laughs> I was really hoping that there would be, there would be a surprise and that someone else would get a chance at facing Moxley or, or Brody Lee, whoever won it. And, uh, no, Brian Cage ended up winning. Yeah, I know there were, and that's that this was kind of the most wrestling match too. Like where it's like, oh, we have an unannounced opponent. And that person's the one who comes in and wins. Yeah. That's very, that's very mm-hmm. wrestling. Um, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. AEW always does a good job of like, okay, I think this is probably what will happen, but you never 100% are for sure. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. I, I, I agree with you. I think they do a better job in that of it's not being as predictable every, every, uh, so often you really don't know who's going to win or it will be a match. It'll be a fun, entertaining match that, there isn't, you know, either person could win and it, it makes both guys look good. Well, we'll move on to the third match of the evening. And uh, again, Richard, these these are guys that I love to get like your first impression of. The first one is uh, the guy who goes by MJF taking on Jungle Boy Jack Perry, which I don't know if you know, but that is uh, the Perry from 90210 fame. That's his son, Jungle Boy. Oh, so this is Luke Perry's son? Yes. Oh, which he uh, I, I I don't know if he likes being called Jungle Boy Jack Perry. Uh, Jim Ross does it all the time, but I know I thought I heard that he took up the Jungle Boy name because he didn't want to like earn any kind of extra reputation off of his dad's name. Yeah, well, I could see it. I could see. It. I do want to say that I I was happy with the with the broadcasting booth. I I I'm. That 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 did give me a that did take me back and give me some nostalgia feels. Oh yeah, right. The, uh, Tony Schiavone and yeah, yeah, yeah. That made me feel good because like because the thing here's the here's the thing that I liked about the two of them is that when when I recall watching WWE now, you know, like the King always. He he was he was he would comment on the match, but he'd always like he was he would he tried to come off as like the heel broadcaster. Yeah. Almost yeah. like, hey, yeah. let's root for the bad guy. And and in this instance, like you didn't have I I I'm glad that you don't have a heel broadcaster. You just have two people talking about the match. Yeah, right. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, no. I I enjoy that trio aspect between them and Excalibur, and, and yeah, and just talking and having a good time with it. And, and like, 
I always loved Tony Schiavone in WCW and obviously always loved Jim Ross in WWE. And I think that was a smart grab from AEW is to grab both those guys up. Uh, Cause you know, yes, yeah, sure. There's, there's times where they fumble and whatnot, but to me, it makes it more believable as a sports broadcasting than just exactly you know, like agree. you were saying. Exactly. It does. It makes it feel, yeah, it's just two people commenting on a match and, and it, you know, like no, nobody's pl- nobody's doing a bit, you know. Yeah, it's like you said. It's it it gives it more of a feel of 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 it being a sport. Yeah, what I love, I like I, Tony Schiavone was always one of my favorites, and seeing him get back into wrestling after he kind of got almost ostracized out of it and like fell out of love with it. Mm-hmm. Hearing him talk about AEW and being back into it, and just listening to him, like you can tell he's having fun, like he's enjoying yeah. all this, and it's a yeah. blast for him. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you any of you if you guys listen to his podcast, what happened when, but it's it's freaking hilarious. He's just like he's an awesome dude. I haven't I ha- I obviously haven't heard it, but who knows? But um, how'd you on so on this match, uh, which I I mean I don't know I guess kind of spoilers because I feel like I'm gonna be saying this a lot. Um, I noticed there's a lot more physicality i guess than i than i recall it or it, it feels more uh, the oh the overall it feels more impactful and more and more physical than what i recall yeah yeah i i would agree with you on that uh a lot of a lot of stuff nowadays seems very much more impactful than than what it was uh, i know even in the world of wrestling uh, a lot of guys argue back and forth about this, telling these guys, you know, these younger guys that just be careful with what you're doing because you're really potentially cutting your career shorter by doing some of these mm-hmm. crazier moves, these crazier bumps. And uh, y- each guy will tell you, they say, you know, they have a bump card. And it's basically like every 10 bumps, get your 11th one free type of thing. You know, uh, once the card <laughs> runs out, it runs out, man. And, and you can't really yeah. bump anymore. And so, yeah, some of these, some of these moves, some of the, these matches that you just look at them, you're like, Oh my God, man. Uh, seeing a lot more and more guys being bruised up after a match. And then they just keep going. They, they do something else. And I'm, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of, kind of surprising to me. Well, I mean, when you get to a point too now where like, you know, that they're doing their best not to actually hurt each other. When you see those moves that look super close, because I mean, that's the whole idea behind this is like, y- y- you know, that they're, they're, they're trying not to legitimately hurt them each other. You know, like back when I was a kid, it's like, oh yeah, throw him off the cage and break his neck. But like now it's like, you see those moves that look super close, like, oh God, because uh, just a couple of weeks ago on Dyn- the Dynamite after this one, actually, uh, I'm pretty sure Mark Quinn actually broke his leg. He's one of the guys from Private Party doing a dive okay. off the top rope onto the outside and landed right on his leg. And I, I'm, I haven't heard anything yet, but I'm pretty sure he broke his leg. It looked, it looked bad, man. And if he didn't do something to it, he did a really good job of, of, uh, making us believe that he did. Well, with, uh, well, that's what they had that in the, in the promo before the match, right? Like the, the, the breaking the leg thing. No, that was a uh, uh, Brit Baker. Brit Baker. She actually messed oh, up her okay, leg too. Okay. This yeah, was uh, a yeah. okay. The private party guy. His was the following Wednesday after this pay per view. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. But MJF is like these are like like what I love about these is these are the two guys that if you know when AEW's around for ten years or whatever, these two guys will be the face of the company if they stay healthy and keep keep good because they're both, you know. Jungle Boy, I think, is great in the ring. I haven't heard him on the mic much, so I'm not sure how he'll do that. MJF is the total package. Like yeah, he's your man. ultimate heel guy. Like, you, like I don't know if they're plants, Richard, but you'll need to watch some of the the shows when they had audiences. Uh-huh. They would do a picture in picture, and he would walk by and piss off like people in the audience, like legitimately, like grab stuff from them, throw hats in the crowd. And I'm not sure if they were plants or real people. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I'm pretty sure they were gotcha. just real people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He's just, oh, I'm going to fuck with people. Yeah, that, yeah, man. He'll go on uh, uh, news shows in whatever states, whatever areas, 
uh, the, before the pandemic. And they'd be like, oh, we're here talking with, you know, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, <laughs> wrestling, right? <laughs> and he just <laughs> is so rude to him. <laughs> Like, it is amazing to get some of these TV anchors' reactions from the stuff that he says. He's just like, oh, forget it, honey. Don't think you have a chance with me. And she's like, what? <laughs> you know, like, it's it's pretty crazy, the stuff that he says and gets away with, man. It's it's funny. He's one of those guys that does such a good job with still keeping kayfabe and you know, you you just love to hate him. Because didn't you state it like he lives the gimmick like 24-7? Yeah, man. Yeah, it's very, very, it's not often that you see him kind of outside that persona. Like, I know previous to really getting into the spotlight, he would do some of the wrestlers kind of vlogs and stuff. And he would kind of be in character, but kind of not. And then other times he just really just takes it and he goes 100 with it. And I think his name's uh, Kenny Johnson. I want to say who does some terrific YouTube mini documentaries with wrestlers. That's the one that I always point people to. Cause it's, it's like a mockumentary. You, you don't know. You're just like, is this real? Is this fake? No, this guy, this has to be fake, but you still question it. You're like, <laughs> cause all the rest of his documentaries are real. Uh, you know, it's talking about the lives of these wrestlers. And then he does the one with MJF and you're just like, Am I am I being worked right now? Is this you know? <laughs> yeah, I, watching that like it, there's a point where he talks about like his family's. I can't remember what their business was that they made money, but you're like that's <laughs> yeah. that's not real. Like that's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> People don't do that. Oh well, we will get. Let's move on to our first title match. It's for the TNT Championship, which uh, is essentially kind of what I think they're going to consider their TV title, but they're letting the the network kind of brand it, which I think is kind of smart. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think. Well, I mean, they are where they are. Like, why? Like, why not? You know, why not get? You know, go all in on it. Yeah, it's unique too. Like, lean into there, it. There's other companies that have TV titles now, I think, but with this, it's their own thing. Um, how'd you guys feel about the look of the belt? Well, they said it wasn't finished. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. Like to they see. said, they were gonna. The, it was missing. They were gonna put like you know inlay it with like gold and whatnot. And it was gonna it was gonna look way better than it did. Yeah, I, I didn't think it looked that bad. I know that some people compared it to the twenty four seven belts at WWE, but I I didn't think it was bad. You know, I I am interested to see. I think it'll look really good once they get that the gold added to it. But uh, mm-hmm. you know, it didn't bother me. I like the 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 red on it, and uh, you know, I think it's a cool idea what they've done. Decided to call it the TNT Championship. Nice little nod. I I, I think. Sean, like you said, it's kind of their way of saying this is our TV title, except we're just going to call it the, the the brand name of the, you know, the channel that we're on. Yeah, why not? Yeah, and I know, so what's cool too, so a lot of people don't like other like color leather belts, like it's, like, it's got to be black, that's all it can be. Yeah. But I really like mm. the red leather. No, I agree. The other thing I keep missing, uh, if you watch, and I just caught it in Dynamite, whenever there's a champion their nameplate will be the color of that belt. So like when Cody came out this past week, since he's the TNT champion now, his uh, nameplate, when they say like Cody Rhodes and all of his details, it's in bright red. Oh, sweet. And so like the champ, the AEW champion has their own color. The women's champion, the tag champions, their nameplates have their own colors, which is kind of a nice little add on in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I like that. That's different. Yeah, I do too. So Cody versus Lance Archer. How'd you feel about this match? Party Janetti. I know Cody's kind of the three star general's kind of what he's been labeled as. <laughs> um, which Rich in in terms of wrestling, so like five stars, there's a guy named Dave Meltzer who rates matches and five stars is like the best. And uh-huh. Cody's known for getting about the three, so like middle tier matches all the time. <laughs> um but Party Janetti, how'd you feel about this one? It, it was a decent match. Uh, you know, I think uh, part of it, this is where Mike Tyson came out, obviously, and and presented the belt, and they had that little mishap of filming him at the time where he yawns, which is never a good thing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm guilty of it. I've yawned at so many different things, so it, it didn't throw me off, but I knew immediately that the wrestling community was going to grab that, and especially the WWE diehards were going to be like, oh, Mike Tyson, he yawned at it. It was such a boring match. I didn't think it was a boring match. I thought it was a decent match. I, I kind of was expecting Lance Archer to win it. I was surprised that he didn't, but... 
in the, in the same vein, though, I thought they, they did a good job with it. I love Jake Roberts. I love Arn Anderson. Those are two great guys they have in their corners. I like the play-by-play between the two of them. Uh, the match could have been a little bit something more than what it was, but they did what they did with it, and, uh, you know, overall, it was a good finish. You know, it took, what, two crossroads, I think it was, to yeah. to get the yeah. pin? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you love know, when he kept... came out too, and Lance Archer hits his finisher right at the get go. Yeah, and yeah. Cody had to roll out. Yeah. I there was a little a little bit of me that thought he was going to finish the match right there, like he was going to finish yeah. it, and like <laughs> Cody was going to lose super quick. I'm like, yeah. that's one way to get him over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that was the thing too. I thought they they did a good job of keeping Lance Archer strong. I, you know, there wasn't anything in it that made me think, oh, he's weak. He got beat by Cody. I didn't think that at all. Yeah, I mean, really with that, too, you could think it was kind of overconfidence that kind of cost him the match because he probably could have ended it sooner if he if he would have, you know, tried to hit his move again later in the match. Well, it seemed like for the first like the first at least 25, 30 percent of the match, like Cody's getting knocked around all over the place. I did like I did like Jake, Jake and Arn Anderson. That made me feel good. I was like, I know those guys. <laughs> well, you know, you know Dusty Rhodes, right? Yes. Uh, and you know that Cody's his son, right? Okay. Yes. That's always like whenever I talk about AEW wrestling to people, I'm like, you know who the American Dream is, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. I'm like, his son is basically a big part of this company. Well, I know, I remember Gold Dust, Dustin. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that, so I'm saying. Like, you know, I'm I'm familiar with the, with the name. I guess is what I'm saying. So were you guys okay with, or were you upset that Jake didn't get to bring the snake out? <laughs> I was mad. I'm a, I'm I. I got to see it in the little promo before, and I was like, "Ah, he's got the snake!" Man, but, that. Uh, I'm so John. You know the Brandy Road snake thing. Where did you land on that? Oh, I I absolutely love when Jake the Snake brings out the snake and really pushes the line and just does his things with that stuff. And it just, it's a part of his gimmick. It's his trademark, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That it's was, been, it's been his trademark for the last like 30 years. Yeah. That was one too with her. It like, it definitely butted up the line of like almost uncomfortable. Like I could see people being upset about it, but again, it's like, it's like, it's Jake Roberts. I mean, this is what this guy does. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. They didn't have anything with him in this next week's of a uh, dynamite with Lance Archer coming back, but I'm kind of curious where he's going to land going forward. If he's going to be one to answer the challenge coming up for that TNT title or not. Well, I don't know. I did. I, and Arn Anderson, I knew I like, I, 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 I did remember him. He, he looks like he has an age. <laughs> no. Yeah. Arn, Arn at Anderson all is, is the perfect. Uh, I've always been 42. <laughs> yeah yeah he's like uh, you know if you're gonna bathe in the blood of virgins like you should have done it in your 20s <laughs> he's kind of like in that in between like i'm kind of still in my like high school jock phase but kind of my dad bod phase <laughs> yep. no nah, it's you know he's he's like he's like every he's like every high school football coach yes, yes. like that's what he looks like yeah right yeah Oh, totally. And he, and he's always looked that way. That's the crazy thing. It's like, I always say him and uh, Greg, the hammer Valentine are guys that have not aged because they have always looked like middle-aged men. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I did also note that. Yeah. Like, like John said that it cut, they, they cut the Tyson yawning and I was like, Oh, Oh, that, that, I like it was quick and they instantly are like, what the fuck are you doing? Like you, you, (laughs) you, you just know that somebody in the booth was like, Different camera, different camera. Live yep. TV. <laughs> well, you know, he was probably stoned out of his mind, so he probably barely even knew he was at a wrestling event. <laughs> I mean, at one point he takes his shirt off, and then he's he's standing at the side of the ring, like doing like flexing, and I'm like, why? What is <laughs> What is the point of this? What there's, is the point of you doing this right now? There's been a history of him in wrestling, and it's never like Every time he's been in it, it always seems awkward and like it takes me out of it. Because uh, even this past Wednesday, he, him and Jericho were getting into it, and yeah. it, he was trying to rip his shirt off. Uh, Tyson was trying to rip his own shirt off and had trouble doing uh-huh. it. Now, 
<laughs> I wouldn't say this to Tyson's face because that dude still looks like he could knock my head off. Like he oh, is still jacked. Thousand yeah, percent. Uh, they were like talking about the whole Jericho thing. And I guess like 10 years ago, they had a spot in the ring where Tyson went to punch Jericho, you know, and he like fell down. And if you watch yeah. like Jericho falls probably like a foot away from the punch. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> I'm not taking that to the chin. Yeah. Fuck no. That bump card's not getting filled up with a Tyson punch. <laughs> <laughs> that counts as two bumps. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I enjoyed the match. Uh I kind of was hoping Lance Archer would win too, just to to kind of keep pushing the the Cody needing like 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 the win, like almost like trying too hard to prove that he belongs. Yeah, right. Um, hmm. So this is kind of gonna start his, you know, I've I've reached the mountaintop, I guess, run. Uh, okay, but we'll see. I mean, I, I, I enjoy Cody. I think he's had some great matches last year at double or nothing. He wrestled his brother in the match of the year. One of the best matches I've ever seen. Oh yeah. That was a great one. Uh, so we'll move on to yeah. oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was, I was saying, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, if you get a chance, check out the highlights on, on YouTube or wherever it was. It was a really good match. All right. Uh, we get one of the shorter matches of the evening. Uh, the the women's division in AEW I feel is kind of got some bright spots, got some stuff that needs to be improved. But Chris Statlander, the galaxy's favorite alien, taking on Penelope Ford, the blonde, the super bad. I I enjoyed the match. This wasn't a match that was supposed to happen because it was supposed to be Chris Statlander versus Doctor Britt Baker, who was injured the week before, like legit injured. Uh, uh-huh. so rich, you know, getting to see these women wrestle, I'm sure this is when your wife walked in and is like, what the hell are you watching in the living room? The kids are up. <laughs> women, ma- women matches in general have always seemed like they look more painful. Like the, the, like the bumps and the, and the, and the, and the slams to the mat, like everything just looks like, like they hit harder. Like they seem, I, a bit more enthusiastic, I guess is, and I feel like that's always been the case. Like whenever I watch a women's match, I'm like, ah, have have you watched much of the? uh, Because I know some of the women in WWE are really, really good, and I think their matches all look a little bit smoother. But I think Chris Statlander and Penelope Ford. Correct me if I'm wrong, John, but they're they're fairly green, right? Like they they've only been wrestling for four or five years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the sense of of uh, wrestling in general, they yeah they they've uh, kind of like I want to call them rookies, but in the sense of the they're newer. I I think they're in between, you know, a little out of the green space and more into uh, just getting you know getting a better understanding of the ring. Obviously, they're talented and they they've made a name for themselves so much so that they've uh, been put into these bigger spotlights. You know, I mean, there's other, mm-hmm. other people that you can call green and you're like, Oh yeah, you're, you're staying in the Indies, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> uh, in that sense, like when you compare them to other people on the spotlight, yeah, yeah, they, they're relatively new. Oh, and I loved the, the, my, my highlight of this match was Statlander's Tope Sudacita, where yeah. she, I, I don't think if Kip Saban was there to help catch, you know, Penelope Ford might be dead right now. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a short match. Um, one of the things with uh, with my son, he loves watching wrestling too, but we actually can't watch the women's wrestling matches. And Why? Uh, well, he really, really likes women's wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't quite know how to verbalize it yet and some things happen and you're like don't worry son it'll come <laughs> me too me too it's like something's happening in my special place i'm like me too me too don't tell your mother <laughs> uh the next match of the night uh it was a, a match that was announced right at the end this was one that of all the matches kind of upset me <laughs> Uh, it was the Dustin Rhodes versus Sean Spears match. And I Sean Spears, he's been doing a lot of the AEW darks, and he's kind of gone more of the comic route, which is fine. I think he does a great job with it. But in this match specifically, I felt like they kind of buried him as a character. Yeah, Like, he's a, he's a big dude. He's strong. He's really good in the ring from what I've seen. 
But in this match, he calls some guy out, calls Dustin Rhodes out, who's a great wrestler, but has been, you know, on a losing streak, kind of aging. And, you know, they did a good spot where Sean Spears is like, no, you got to count him out because he's not going to be here. And he has them play their yeah. music and he does the whole look to the screen like, ah, I gotcha, he's not here. But then he actually does show up. Dustin Rhodes shows up right. and proceeds to pull his pants down, spank his bottom and all kinds of craziness. <laughs> Loses in less than four minutes. I was just saying, like, was this, I mean, can we, uh, is, is this classified as a, as a match? Is that what are we, is that what we're calling it? Cause it was based, cause that's what it seemed like. It seemed like five minutes of watching a thing where a dude has his ass out. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was on purpose or not on purpose. Oh man. I was, I was just waiting for the frontal. I was like, Oh, this is very <laughs> dangerous, man. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think I think he used some of that boob tape just to be sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As well, he should have. You think Tyson yawning is going to get some news highlights? <laughs> <laughs> but I I'm curious how how it's going to turn. I know they could kind of say like, of course he lost. He wasn't like in tights or in any kind of wrestling gear at all. But I, I you know, when he came in, his Sean Spears' first action in AEW was hitting Cody Rhodes in the head with a chair and busting him open. Like mm-hmm. he came into AEW as a badass and since losing to Cody, he's kind of started getting pushed more to the end and not really being showcased much, which I, I I just I like him. I think he'd be a cool fit, like, you know, in that TNT championship type run. And I hope they push him into that direction. Yeah, I, I hope so too, Sean. I, I think uh if there's anyone in AEW just in general that really I've been surprised at the way that the things have turned. It would be Sean Spears. I was expecting a lot more for him. I think he's very talented in the ring. I think the new cre- character that he created was pretty, pretty awesome. And uh, I was a little disappointed with where and how it's gone. I, I think they could do a better job of utilizing him, especially at a time where I feel that they need a, a few more heels and, oh, and yeah. strong heels. Like MGF does a great job, but you know, uh, uh, Sean Spears would be a great person to also be put put into the battle with, for the TNT championship. So then we get to our second title match of the evening. It's the Women's World's Heavyweight, or I guess Women's World Championship, and it's Nyla Rose, the champion, taking on Hirakira Shida. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on this match? I was visceral. I guess that's the best way I can put it. <laughs> yeah. Beat like, the shit got, out of like, each other. Yeah, he did. Yeah, man. The, yeah. A lot. They went all over. Yeah. Yeah, they did. All over. I, I was uh wanting that that was that's what I wanted in that match. And and I think they did a good job with it. I I, I like that better than I thought I would. And uh I, I thought they did a really good job with it. I was surprised too about uh championships switching hands there, but it was good. Overall good and and man did it they seemed to beat the hell out of each other. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of those matches that I love AEW for because, you know, Rose has been champion for what, like 60 or 70 days. And, well, no, I guess it's, I don't know, it's probably been about that. Maybe, maybe 80 days. But of a majority of that, she hasn't been on TV because of everything going on. Mm-hmm. Sheeta has been there and she's been number one for about that amount of time. But it felt too early for that belt to change hands. And like I said, I love Sheeta. I think she's a great athlete in the ring and she's one of my favorite women wrestlers so it was kind of like i feel like it's too early she's going to get in this match and she's going to lose and then you know it's kind of like statlander statlander i thought you know she got a title match and lost but she to get in the belt and it changing hands so early i was i was really surprised by that and in the match yeah. too like there was no like oh yep rose is going to win or oh nope she is going to win it was up to the wire like who's going to come out of this with that belt and that's that's what it takes me back to being a kid when you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But again, you know, again, like, I, like I was saying with the, with the other women's match that like, it just seems it just, they just seem like they hit harder and it, you know, they don't hold back as much and, and, and everything just seems more, more smacky, more, Im- more impactful. 
more visceral. Well, then we get to one of the two main events for the evening. It's John Moxley taking on Mr. Brody Lee, which, Richard, if you don't know, uh, Brody Lee was a former WWE guy, um, kind of had his head butting with Mr. McMahon. And so his mm-hmm. character that he has here in AEW is kind of like a twist on a Mr. McMahon. So that's why he's got to be called Mr. Brody Lee. Oh, but, okay. I got the impression that he was like a, he was trying to come off like a cult leader. Like I said, like a Vince McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But John, how'd you feel about this match? What'd you think about this as one of our two main events? Yeah, I, I thought it was uh, decent. I mean, that's... I was wondering too in this how how the order was going to go with these matchups if uh this was going to be the main events if the women's match was going to be the main events or the whole uh the stadium st- uh, stampede <laughs> match was going to be the main events and the the way that it played out I thought they did a good job with it uh, each match had kind of uh, an exciting build um out of the 3 I I would say that this was my least favorite. I I liked the obviously the uh the match that we're going to be talking about the most, but uh really enjoyed the women's match and then I was kind of disappointed with this one just in terms of they really built up the Brody Lee character. I I think this would have been a good keep going with it moments, let him have a run with the title uh and then they can he and Moxley can fight again at the next pay-per-view and then Moxley win it back or whatever. Uh, I I think they did a disservice to the character of Brody Lee to come in and and you know be kind of this big happening and then get defeated right away and uh, I I don't know I thought for sure when I saw the TNT Cody win then that kind of made me feel that Brody Lee was solidified as the champion for for against Moxley and when that didn't happen yeah I liked the finish that once again. Both guys look strong, and I, I really like the whole. Hey, he just kind of knocked him out with a sleeper hold. Um, it doesn't doesn't make anyone look weak. He you know tried to fight through it and just didn't work. And and uh, I just expected a little bit more with it, um, especially with such the build up. But uh, overall, not a bad match, but n- not the best match on the pay per view. Yeah, it left me wanting a little bit more too. I know it's. I do like that they kept both characters strong. Uh, it was one of the situations where it was a ref's decision. You know, Brody Lee did not tap, did not get pinned. Um, he kicked out of the uh, um, paradigm shift. Uh, mm-hmm. And essentially it took a paradigm shift through the stage, which watching it in slow motion, John Moxley looks so close to smacking the edge of the ring. Yeah, oh, he oh, did. That would have jacked him up. Uh, but, but yeah, I was kind of the same boat. I thought, you know, like, you know they're they're bringing in these guys pretty quick like Brody Lee you know he's been in the AEW for you know 3 weeks or so or I'm sorry about 3 months loses this big match you know Lance Archer's kind of the same way he came in about 3 months ago with a lot of fanfare he lost this match um Sean Spears I guess technically was kind of the same way so it just makes me nervous that whenever you know you get these big names that come in and they kind of get buried um shortly after making it now you know these storylines can grow obviously and that's what the the magic of wrestling is is that you build off this uh yeah but also in wrestling it's okay we've closed this you know this season or this you know run of stories now on to the next one so we'll see how it turns up but so rich what do you think of this match um overall it felt it felt solid to me if honestly um it remind it uh, Nostalgia, not nostalgia wise, but if, if I was to compare it to something, it reminded me a lot of a um, like any match that you would see that involved Bret Hart, where it was kind of punchy, but a, it was much more technical. Yeah. And then and and ended and ended, you know, in a in a technical way. If it then and. and you know, one of the things that you that you saw with like with, with Bret Hart was, you know, his matches, you know, would kind of go on and and they were and they were more technically based rather than let's just stand up and punch each other or let's fly around the ring. Things seemed it, overall this it, it felt, you know, it, it it was good. It was it was solid and it felt a lot more grounded than than what you then the especially compared to a lot of the other matches to me. 
All right. So then I think if you guys are ready, we can go on to the main event of the evening. The first ever stadium stampede match. It is the elite, which is Adam Page, Kenny Omega, Matt, and Nick Jackson with Matt Hardy taking on the inner circle. Le champion Chris Jericho, who, you know, since the pod rockers have left, he's lost the belt again. He lost it at a at a steakhouse because we kind of failed him. But, you know, since he kicked us out of the club, he's lost it for good. And that's not on us. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, okay. That's right. Okay. Jake Hager, Sammy Guevara, Santana Ortiz. So I laughed. I cried. I gasped. I did all the things in this match. I want to know how you guys felt about it. What what feelings did you get from this amazing match? Okay, I have I have two questions, and and I, I guess I'm I'm guess I guess I'm just curious. I'll ask both of you. Was this entire thing pre-taped? Do you think that this was pre-taped and then shown, or was it no? Or was it Richard? Sh- it was live because when you saw Matt Hardy go in the water and come out, like that's because it's 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 Matt Hardy. He can he can shift his outfits just like that. <laughs> okay. No, it it was it, they haven't hidden that either. Like it was definitely pre-taped. I think they took like five or six hours to tape all this. Uh huh. Uh huh. Which, so I guess the, I guess the, you know, considering that it was pre taped, do, do you feel like, do you feel like it should have been, what, what is the overall tone you were want, you were wanting to get and did you get it? Oh, man. Sean or John. Y- you know, I, I had to say some of the uh, best, matches throughout the uh, few past few years have all been pre-taped matches and they've been to these crazies. Like the one I think that really puts all this on the map is at the Hardy compound when, when Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy fought for TNA and they just did this pre-taped match and it, it broke outside of the mold of, of just wrestling fan. It was actually people watching and being like, Oh my God. And, and people that had not watched wrestling and forever, come back and they watch it and they're like, holy crap, that was awesome. That was so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it was, and you know, it still lives on obviously. And now Matt Hardy's a part of a new pre-taped match that now people are talking about again. And, uh, it it really, it, it really held everything that I thought it would do. And I was very happy with it. And, uh, like Sean said, it was like almost, I laughed a lot, man. And I, I realized I just enjoyed myself. And that's the one thing that I think people need to, uh, just realize in general, whether they're wrestlers, wrestling fans, people who've been in the business forever, whatever, is that it's just like any movie, any different genre, you know, people are going to enjoy certain things over another, but ultimately was, did you get enjoyment out of this thing? And yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to throw this out. I enjoyed it. I want to keep it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think whenever you have stuff like this, as long as it's not for like what I consider like a title or something like that, I can really get behind it. Like, you know, there was, there's a storyline stake here, but it wasn't, you know, and they didn't even try to like sell it as that, you know, being serious. You know, they, they, they all kind of had a part in playing that this was a fun one off idea. Like this wasn't just some kind of, you know, silliness happening inside of a ring. It's like, no, this is a stadium stampede match. So of course we're going to have the Jacksonville mascot. Of course we're going to ask for a replay. Of course we're going to, you know, suplex a guy all the way across the football field. And there's going to be a horse. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, <laughs> oh yeah, the horse. Oh man, Adam Page. So Adam Page has a drinking problem, Rich. In case you didn't realize, <laughs> what? <laughs> so the whole like cowboy bar scene was amazing. Like scooting him across yeah. the the thing, dropping him on that table. <laughs> uh, the yeah. finish to the match, the one winged angel off the top of the essentially off the top of the stadium. Uh, mm. I know it was on like a splash pad kind of setup, but still, like that was just an insane move to end this thing. Oh yeah, man! Yeah, I I, I don't yeah. care who you are, like well, especially because they were standing on that platform, and one of the guys, like, well, they were both kind like kind of like soaking wet, so you could tell that like their footing wasn't a hundred a hundred percent. Oh yeah, it like was scary. You, <laughs> like for a second, you're like, don't slip, don't slip, don't slip. 
Well, I mean, that's yeah. that's the thing with wrestling is like you put a lot of trust in some other man's hands. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Like you said, I mean, like if he gets on that edge and he slips, well, now you're fall. Oh, if he does it too quick and somehow your head hits his leg differently or awkward or you land awkward, it's like, guess what? You don't get to walk ever again. And that's yeah. what I find amazing about these guys is how talented they are to do that stuff. I guess th- if I had any, if I had any, I guess, criticism of this one, I would say that like, since you're pre-taping it and you have a lot of different things going on at once, I almost wonder if it wouldn't be better to, you know, film, film each kind of group by themselves and then cut it together a bit, a bit better. Cause it seemed like there were kind of ups. There were, there were, it, it felt like there were lulls in a play in, in a match where there shouldn't be any lulls. Yeah. I think they were trying to cut it. So it felt like it was live. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's, and and I guess, you know, at that point, like, I'm kind of going like, why, like, why, you know, why try and do that? Because, you know, you know, anybody can see that it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I I think you do walk a fine line with that too. And especially kind of like sometimes there's a reason for those lulls and matches uh, in the same way, like just like a movie, right? It's just trying to build up to, to a certain climax and then, yeah, there's your finish and whatnot. But yeah, at some points, and that was the thing, like, in the beginning, I was honestly questioning watching this match. Like I thought, was is this legitimately live or is this, you know, pre-taped? And and it wasn't really until the Matt Hardy situation that I was like, Oh yeah, no, it confirmed for me. I'm like, no, this this was yeah, that was, that was but, the same boat. I mean, if they would have cut from that for a little bit longer and then came back like where it was legit, like he could have maybe changed, I probably would have yeah, bought right? it a little yeah. bit longer. <laughs> but it was just like a straight like they dunk him in the water, no cut at all, and he comes out with a different outfit. Yeah, <laughs> which I want to talk about that. Like Matt Hardy playing all these different personas of his past. I, I don't remember if he did this in Impact or the other ones. I know with the bracket, the broken Matt Hardy uh, character, but I love that he's just playing these different characters in AEW like this. Yeah, I, I like that he, he basically took the failed gimmick in WWE and now he's he's making something with it. What what people originally wanted. And he's actually doing it in AEW, and it's still getting over. Like he brought back the back the the mat facts for this yeah. too, you know. And so it was just like it was just fun, you know, just overall seeing this stuff and, and being that able to made do me that. laugh. Yeah, I think the parts I laugh laughed out loud was uh, Chris Jericho, pretty much most of his, like putting the cone on his head and doing the witch laugh again. Uh, yeah. giving the Judas effects to the, the Jacksonville <laughs> the Jaguars mascot, Jazz mascot <laughs> call, uh, throwing a flag on uh, um, Aubrey Edwards oh, and then yeah, going yeah. in the replay tent when they comes up. It's like, no, it was two. You're a shitty referee. Yep. <laughs> yep. Having the line drawn on him too. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That was, yeah, that, that was funny. Yeah. Drawing the line on him. And, but yeah, the, the, the one part that I recall laughing was was the bit with Matt in the pool yeah. where it cuts to the fact that he can apparently hold his breath <laughs> for three <laughs> minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, what? And then Ortiz yeah. and Santana are like counting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then- I, I did love that. I forget who it was, but one of them was like, I can't swim. And he's like, are you serious? <laughs> and he like climbs down the ladder. Like, it's three feet. It's three feet. And then yeah. uh, when, uh, when Hardy was floating in the water, it's like, yeah, we killed him. He's we dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, and uh rich i know you didn't watch this week but apparently the inner circle created uh first ever stadium stampede championship t-shirts <laughs> so now they need to figure oh. out what they need to do with them they're available on pro wrestling tees for 1250 <laughs> if you want to get one <laughs> oh okay so they're half price oh, that's amazing <laughs> but uh and that's I know uh, when we first talked about AEW uh, probably close to a year ago, Rich. I know when I mentioned Chris Jericho, you're like, "Wait, Chris Jericho's in this?" And yeah, you know, I love that he was the serious character when he had the belt, and really just trying to help get this company, you know, some notoriety. And now he's taking it into a fun direction with this group. And I just 
I, I still get like a warm feeling every Wednesday night getting to watch this stuff, even during all this that's going on, even though there's no crowds, but getting, you know, something every Wednesday that entertains me for a couple hours. And these pay-per-views every three months is just great stuff. And I applaud them for it. They do. They do kind of have that, uh, that D generation X feel, I guess is, is probably the, the only thing I can compare it to in my head. The inner circle. Yeah, yeah, they're a little bit yeah. more hokey in my opinion, but like a little bit more slapsticky, I guess. Oh, I agree. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, at one point, Degeneration X did that thing where they had the army helmets on and they're rolling around in a tank. That's true. Yeah, right. So yeah. invading WCW. Yeah. 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 Which, funny side note, Richard, the elite did that to WWE. <laughs> well, there you go. Ah, oh, yes. There you go. So uh, as we're tidying this up, I want to hear Richard's closing thoughts, and I want to hear – so Master Podcaster's closing thoughts, and I want to hear Party Genetti's closing thoughts. So Master Podcaster, let's get yours first. Um, Well, like I said in the beginning, was I entertained? Yes. I guess now, I guess now after, after listening to, to everybody talk and getting a bit more of a, of, of a context – around matches you know they seem i i guess overall i would say that this felt a lot more professional i guess is for you know for for lack of a better word it seemed you know like it's a okay like you know the the main event you know stadium stampede match aside overall everything felt a lot more a lot more serious that they, you know, it felt like they were taking this like, Hey, the, you know, yes, it's entertainment, but it is a sport. Like we've got, you know, two guys that are calling a match seriously. We've got people that are, you know, you know, being super physical and, and, you know, we have, we, we sh- we're showcasing a lot of, you know, high flying ability, a lot of technical ability and, you know, at, while at the same time putting on a good show. So it felt overall, I would say that it felt more professional for, for, you know, for lack of a better word, more professional than what you were expecting. Exactly. I gotcha. Exactly. Which, I mean, if, if you hadn't, I mean, cause if, if your only knowledge of wrestling is WWE and you're like, well, I know there's like these other, like kind of second tier shows. And if you've watched any of them, like they always feel like they're not as high quality as what AEW has been putting on. I could get that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Party Genetti, the other half of the Pod Rockers, what are your closing thoughts on Double or Nothing? Oh man, I I absolutely enjoyed it. It's it just it's one of those things. I think I really needed this, and I I really hope that they had some good buy rates with the uh, the pay per view, especially one of those things where you're like, well, the crowd's not going to be there, so. The energy, the atmosphere, you kind of get worried about that. But they've been able to just show that they don't necessarily need that. Uh, I mean, it, it makes it paints the whole picture, but they've done a pretty good job without having it. And, and for what they've been able to do with with what they have, you know, they've made the lemonade out of the lemons that they were given. And, and sure, it might not be the best, uh, but it, it really got the job done and. Overall, really enjoyed it. I, I still, you know, I'm behind this company 100%, and and it's a great alternative to what else is out there. And you know, it it, it hasn't reached a point yet where I feel like the 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 product is basically insinuating that I'm a stupid moron for watching it. So, <laughs> yeah, it's been I've been watching every week uh, since it started up, and. You know, I don't get tired of it. Um, I don't keep up on the AEW Dark. They have a Tuesday show they do too, which is kind of um, some more of the undercard talent. But um, for the most part, you know, being the elite and the road twos and you know Wednesday nights, I'm I'm watching all the time and I dig it. Yeah. Uh, so before we do any housekeeping, John, is there any place you want to send anybody to check out anything that you've been working on? Uh, no, obvious. Uh, um. Uh, honestly, not at this moment. I, I'm kind of taking a break from everything. I'm just kind of relaxing and, and doing my own thing and, and actually getting into painting Dungeons and Dragons miniatures. So, yes. so I don't have anything set up for that. <laughs> no Instagram or anything on, on my process, but 
uh, it's been nice and it's been therapeutic and it's it's a good break from it all. I like it. Yeah, you need to start doing some like Starfinder characters and send them my way. I'll yeah, have to man. Do some bones yeah. for that. We've been playing oh, yeah. Starfinder a ton. It's a blast. I just oh, I love sweet. tabletop. Like my love now is like baseball, wrestling, and tabletop, and then my family, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're there. <laughs> All right. Well, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. You can visit our website at languageofbroance.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at languageofbro. Email us at bros at languageofbroance.com. You can like us on Facebook, and there's always a couple of ways you can support the show. You can spread the bromance by liking, retweeting, and sharing our show on Reddit. And you can also pick up some of that sweet, sweet LLB merchandise at our T Public store. You get those shirts, you go out on stage, and everybody's going to be throwing their dollar bills at you. Love it. Uh, and if you want to take a bigger step, you can help us. You can join our Patreon account. It's www.patreon.com slash language of bromance. And we always want to thank Wendy and Aaron for being our Patreon members. You two rock. All right, gentlemen. Is there anything else before I close her out? Don't you ever, ever try and do a show without me again. Do you understand? Say you understand. I understand. Thank you. I'm done. I was trying to think, was it go back to Winnipeg? <laughs> go, yeah, go back to Toronto. I'm from Winnipeg, you idiot. <laughs> all right, well, that's all the bromance we have for this show. I'm Sean Michael. And I'm Richard, the master podcaster. And I'm Party John Eddy. And remember, don't be a why. Be a why, be a why not. not. And stay off the streets. And be elite. elite. <laughs> <laughs>